Hello, welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at Goldsmiths, part of the University of London, in London, England, where we're going to be speaking about cultural entre entrepreneurship. We've got two guests today, Martin Humphreys, who's the director of the Cinema Museum here in London, and Ashley Evenson, who is a recent Goldsmiths graduate who has her own production company. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Well, thank you both for coming on the show. Pleasure. Well, maybe Martin, if we could start with you. I realize that you, you are not a, a recent graduate of Goldsmiths, but perhaps um, you can say a word or two about uh, the museum that you run. Okay, I run the Cinema Museum. We're a museum that's about the experience of going to the cinema. So whilst we have a film collection and a poster collection and a photo collection, we're primarily about the experience of cinema going as it was. So it's a uh, interior design, decor, and technical equipment from cinemas, most of which don't exist now. Fair enough. And Ashley, you have a production company. What does your production company do? So it's, it's like a storytelling agency. So what I do is I go to a number of different communities, schools, some startup businesses, and I help them learn to tell their stories. Well, that's a great way to start this segment. So let's talk about the stories. So when you were at Goldsmiths, did you learn about kind of storytelling through the cultural entrepreneurship work that you did? Yeah, I mean, part of the cultural entrepreneurship program is all about, there's a lot of self-exploration and, you know, really finding skills and creative techniques that you can learn to market um, in, in quite a, a really well-mannered way, if that makes any sense. So, like, you know, there's a lot of things in terms of sustainability and, like, morals and ethics in terms of business and entrepreneurship as you're learning as you go. So I think that's that's part of what I learned in addition to like the creative storytelling and things like that. Fair enough. And in terms of the creative storytelling, Martin, I assume your museum tells not only the macro story of cinema, but also m many, many stories along the way. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, all different kinds of stories, really, from people's own experiences. We get lots of people who visit the museum at whose memories are evoked by the museum and they want to tell you about their own experiences in the past. Or we get young people coming to the museum who are stimulated by what they see and they want to talk to their parents or their grandparents about their experience of cinema going and what it was like for them. So it's like stories spreading through all different kinds of ways really. How do you get people to come to the museum if they didn't even know there was a story to be found? We get, l there's lots of different ways people come to the museum. I mean, we have an enormous uh, number of visitors annually coming uh, because they've either heard about us or read about us or uh, are interested in us. But we also run a huge events program. So people come to see films, they come to see Q&As with people from the film industry. Uh, we may be putting on a music event. Currently, we have an art installation by an artist called Andy Holden, and that's all about uh, animation in some way or another. So last night, for example, he was doing green screen in front of a full audience uh, of over 100 people, and he was appearing in the animations that he is using. And he's telling stories which are mostly about the rules of animation and how those rules get broken. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's very interesting. And, but in terms of the, the entrepreneurial aspect of this, um, I, my understanding is that it's quite difficult to run a museum and it's quite difficult to run a yeah. lot of arts organizations yeah. simply because uh, you know, the margins, it's very difficult financially to make this work. Yeah. So were there financial uh, ideas or entrepreneurial ideas that you got from this program or that either of you explored in England generally or around the world that have helped to deal with the art world in terms of entrepreneurship? Uh, you have to be very light on your feet if you possibly can. I mean we're a small independent museum so we can move very quickly when we need to. Um, I think it's much harder for larger institutions that are maybe are more bureaucratic than we would be um, because you have to find ways of sustaining yourself both artistically and economically, because that's the only way you can survive in this particular climate that we're in, where funding is really, really difficult. Yeah, and I think additionally, there's there's something to be said about keeping up with like 
trends and sort of what the public wants in a way. Like um, with some of the storytelling things that we do at Oval Productions, there's a lot of things where, you know, sometimes it's a media, like a social media campaign, and that's how we're getting people involved. Other times it's live events. So it's all about being able to, to give people what they want and keep them interested in, in finding new and innovative ways to tell stories. But how do you get people to pay money in addition to telling the stories? Because presumably uh, you have to pay the rent, presumably you need to do stuff that, uh, you, you know, there's, there's, there are lights, there's heat and electricity. How do, how, how do you do that? Well, I think part of how I do it personally comes from goldsmiths and my time here and something that I was introduced to which is this sort of theory of design thinking and so it's about like taking prototypes and then building off of those prototypes and seeing what people want and then and then just putting it out there and see what people will pay for and more often than not if you build something that's really great people are happy to pay for it and I mean I've I've been fortunate in discovering this sort of theory that has helped me you know continue to pay the rent so and Martin, do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree, absolutely. I, I think you have to be having as wide an offering as you possibly can. So, for example, we do private hires in the museum as an income stream, but we also do subsidised work with people in the community. So we offer them the space at either a very low rate because we want them to become involved if they can. So you have to have this whole series of different options, structures, offerings for people. Make the net as wide as possible that you can without overstretching yourself, obviously, um, because that means that you've got all these different income streams rather than being reliant on one. I think that's sometimes one of the problems with funding. People become over-reliant on the funding, and if it disappears, they've got nothing to fall back on. Whereas if you're being entrepreneurial in many different ways, that gives you a really good ground base to stand from and to explore different aspects. But I assume at some point you have to say something may be too far afield. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to overstretch yourself in a way that means that you're put placing yourself and the organization at risk. You have to evaluate things clearly rather than just diving into something without thinking about it. <laughs> but if you're working with people, you find different what kind of structures, really, of ways of working with people. So we have a lot of volunteers. We try and get the volunteers to put ideas of what they would like to do so that they're actively involved. So we encourage the volunteers to come up with ideas of film programs that they might want to run. Um, we do lots of different film programs. So there's a film noir season, there's an early talkies season. We do silent films with live music. Um, and that was inspired by the musicians themselves wanting to be able to have a space where they could actually improvise to the films and get more practice about what they're doing. So they are strengthened by this. And if, if volunteers are actively involved, that encourages other volunteers to become actively involved. And you've got a kind of thriving organization then. Fair enough. Ashley, in terms of, uh, I think you're of a slightly different generation than the other two people who are on the set right now. <laughs> yes. If you were to get a mailing or some information from the Cinema Museum, yeah. what would excite you about the Cinema Museum or any other museum? What would be the things that you would like to look for in engaging? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I mean, this happened really recently, actually. I got um, a flyer from the Museum of Greenwich about a photography exhibition, and it was all about um, astrophotography. And so I think it's just finding, finding cool. I think astrophotography happens to be super cool, so I went to the exhibition. But I think any time that there's something that sort of speaks to an interest or or whatever, I think that is something that brings people in. But also, um, I love inter interactivity. So anytime that there's an exhibition where like I get to be part of the exhibition myself, I think that's something that really mm -hmm. drives me as both a consumer and a creator. So, yeah. That, that's interesting. Could you, what would be an example of that? 
Um, oh gosh. Oh, I know. Sorry. Okay. So I recently went to a production of something called Say Something Bunny, and it was a theater immersive experience where everybody goes in and they each become a character and they're listening to like this wire recorder um, from, I don't know, it had to have been like the 1950s or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's basically a, an archival piece of history of, you know, somebody's life in the 1950s. And the creator of it helped like to, to figure out all of the research based on what was going on during the time of this recording. And then as you know, a consumer, I sat there and I was able to be one of the characters in the wire recording. So it's, it's things like that, that I think are really sort of astounding. And so do you think, not to put you on the spot, but do you think that had it not been as interactive, perhaps you wouldn't have been as engaged with it? Yeah, if somebody just put a wire recording up and was like, listen to this, I would have been like, cool, this is great for 10 minutes, I'm gonna go. But if but the fact that I actually became one of the characters in the story, like that gives that gives the audience ownership. And I think anytime the audience can can have some work to do when they're engaging with something, I think that's really important. Fair enough. And, and Martin, uh, no doubt you've thought about uh, different generations coming to your museum. H how do you deal with that issue? Uh, well, it's not really an issue in in many senses because. We get young people coming who are really interested in the past and engage with it and connect with it, who probably go back and talk to their parents or their grandparents about where they've been. And when older people come, their memories are being stimulated by their own experiences from the past and often they start recalling things. So they'll talk about when they went to the cinema and what happened to them and how engaged they were with it and how different it might be in the past from what they experience now uh, because cinema going now is very different from how cinema going was in the 30s, 40s and 50s. So you get all these different generations coming and they take their own piece, if you like, and work with it in many senses. Um, we talk about being a happy museum and we're part of there's a much wider project called the happy museum project and it's about that museums are places of well-being even if you don't know it so you feel better for having gone that's the main experience that probably covers everybody well that's interesting i mean i, I suppose you could say that about a concert yeah. hall as well yeah of course i mean music is fantastic so it's it's things that stimulate you. I mean, it's like Ashley was saying, she went to this immersive experience and it was much richer for her than it would have been if she was a passive uh, listener to it. So if you're engaged, you have a much more positive experience about it. Interesting. And then in terms of, if I can shift a little bit in yeah. terms of the content of the cinema museum. Yeah. So if that cinema museum, your cinema museum, was in the United States or Canada yep. or, or Belgium, yep. would it be a different museum? It would be a different museum because different nationalities have different cinema experiences in the way in which they showed films, where they showed films, how they showed the films. You can't necessarily replicate it from country to country. So in Britain, Cinema was an incredibly popular experience for people. It was probably the most popular entertainment form that they had. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be true elsewhere. There would be other competing forms of entertainment. I mean, America, or the USA, is such a big country that you would probably have to narrow it down as to what the New York experience might be, or the San Francisco experience might be. Whereas in Britain, because we're a relatively small country, it was pretty much the same from Land's End to John O'Groats, in that sense, really. Um, I think that your strengths as an artistic organisation are often to do with the roots of your organisation and where you came from and why you came into being. And if you keep your core, really, then you're always going to be able to offer something. Do you agree with that, Ashley? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so in running Oval Productions, before all of this, before I even came to Goldsmiths, I had a career as um, a playwright and a producer in theater. And I knew that I wanted to keep doing performance and things of that nature, but I wanted to do it in a different way. And I think coming coming here to the UK and also coming specifically to Goldsmiths, that I got a, a foundation education into really exploring the different avenues of an artist as my, like myself, just as an artist, but also how I can build up other artists and other creativity. And that is where Oval Productions came from. So I think that there's a lot of truth in, in what Martin said. Well, how do we deal with the issues of, of lack of commonality? So one of the things that's intrigued me about the arts world over the years is that there's an assumption that we know something that came before. What if we don't know the thing that came before? How do we bring people the knowledge of what happened before, whether it's an art thing or a history thing, in such a way that it's not hitting people over the head? It's a good question. Um. <laughs> but what's the answer? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think it's kind of an ongoing question that we have to continually ask ourselves. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to expose the next generation to, you know, what has come before, you know, and I think that being able to do that through social media, through campaigning, um, through involving the next generation and young people in the conversation um, of, you know, where arts are going and where they've been is really important as well. Um, but I think that's, that's a question that is continually being asked within the arts community. Well, if I can ask you specifically as someone who's, who, who's representing your generation here. So w Martin mentioned something that happened at his museum last night. Would you have paid $10 or 10 pounds to go to an event like that if you weren't all that familiar with it before? Well, that's difficult because first of all, living in London, there's a lot of free things to do. So there's a lot of free arts and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of times myself and I think my generation take advantage of what can we do that's, you know, not going to break the bank. Although I've paid, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds to see really great exhibitions that I'm interested in. So if I if I followed this artist for example, then no question I would have been at that event with, you know, him doing the animation and stuff like that. I would have thought that was really cool. And Martin, you might have a thought or two about this, I assume. You just have to be as wide-reaching as you possibly can. I mean, Ashley's right. There are so many things going on in London that people are really are spoiled for choice. So you have to make sure that what you're offering is either niche or is going to be something that will grab people's I interest. I mean, one of the things we do as a museum is we have an educational role, obviously, um, which means that we work with students from mostly from universities rather than from schools um, quite wide ranging to try and engage people in some kind of creative process because a lot of young people want to get something out of what they're engaged with they don't want to be a passive person watching it they want to be much more actively connected with it in some way or another and if that's what you're offering a way into something that means that you have some kind of creative connection with it, it's much more enriching. So people will engage with you if they think they're going to be enriched by it. And more likely to pay the $10 or the and 10 more pounds. And more likely to pay the 10 pounds or the $10. Um, that's another element really because there are so many possibilities going on, you have to try and pitch your pricing for whatever your range of events is in a way that's affordable for people. Um, now, people will, go, will pay to go and see something that is absolutely wonderful. So people will go to theatre in the West End because it's really cool or because it's going to give them a real experience but in terms of making offerings to people, it's much better to have a range of possibilities so that, in a sense, you're making yourself affordable to all kinds of pockets and not just one 
type of audience. So in the theater example, you mean that there are very expensive seats right yeah. in front of the stage, and then there are seats that aren't as expensive yeah. on the sides. Yeah. And yeah. people go for what they can afford. Yeah. But also, yeah, even on that sense, there's a lot of different theaters that offer, you know, they'll do, they'll do preview nights for £10, yeah. and so £10 in any seat. And they'll do that as like a last dress rehearsal or something like that. So I think there, there's different ways to get everybody of every sort of income level into arts. Well, we, we only have a few minutes left. So is there anything that, uh, that either of you would like to say about the kind of entrepreneurial aspects of, of the artistic world that we haven't covered? <laughs> I think you have to keep a very open mind so that you're willing to explore possibilities. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, but you shouldn't be afraid to fail. That's one of, that's one of the things people are slightly scared of, that they might get involved in something and it doesn't work. But you have still had the experience of doing it, and you probably have come away with something that maybe you didn't even know when you started off at the beginning. So the right to fail is absolutely essential. Could I put you on the spot and ask you what one of your biggest failures was that you learned from? Um, we decided that we were going to do a, a film series of uh, classic movies, what we considered to be classic movies. What we hadn't realized is they're not necessarily classics to other people. So it didn't work. We got terrible houses <laughs> for them. Uh, and we had already programmed six films, so we had to continue with it, even though it wasn't drawing the audiences in. So we realized that we needed to do more background preparation beforehand, and that what we should have been doing is talking to people about what they considered to be a classic movie, not just what we considered to be a classic movie. And do you mind me asking one more follow-up on that, yep. which is, which is what is a classic movie versus a non-classic movie? Okay, well, The Grapes of Wrath, for example, we thought was a classic movie from the 40s. Um, but people under the age of 40 don't know about it, haven't heard of it, haven't seen it, because cinema programming patterns have completely changed from how they used to be when I was at university, where you would have repertory cinemas showing old films all the time. This doesn't happen now. The main place that you see old movies is television, with a channel called Talking Pictures being the most popular. But if you go to the cinema, you really only see contemporary films now. There are very few cinemas that do revival programs. And unless you're a media studies student, you're not going to be looking at the history of European cinema, American cinema. So even films like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, people don't know about it now. And we get people coming to the museum who don't know who Betty Davis is, which seems shocking to me. But if you're 16, why would you know? Because you don't have the opportunities to see those films or to learn about that history, because patterns have changed. Yeah. I mean, I I know who Betty Davis is, so. Well, this wasn't a test as to whether or not you knew who <laughs> Betty Davis was. I, I was. I was looking at you in terms of the generational perspective, not, not if it was a classroom. You know, but you know what, I do have to say, uh, it is one of those things, like, I, because I, when I was a kid, we used to go to, like, old film screenings and stuff like that in the town that I grew up. And so I saw things like Casablanca yeah. and things like that. But now, if somebody were to ask me about, like, what is a great classic film, I might say, you know, 16 Candles or The Goonies, which are all, you know, mm -hmm. from the 80s. And I think a lot of, of kids these days might be like, what's The Goonies? And I'd be like, what? That's a classic. So I guess one follow-up to that is, would Star Wars be a classic? Yeah. Yeah. In yes. Your, in your mind, th that would be so. Do you agree with that, Martin? The first three films, yes. And what makes the first three classics and not the ones after it? Well, I would say it's to do with commercialization. The first three films were kind of purer in spirit, if you like. <laughs> um, and subsequently, they became about merchandising and the kind of uh, making 
money off the back of the films, not necessarily to do with the film itself uh, in that way. Um, but somebody else might say, oh no, they're rubbish, I don't think they're classic films at all. Or other people might go, oh no, that was my favourite film as a child. <laughs> you just don't know. But you shouldn't be in your own mindset only. You should try and reach out and round that and think out of the box. Well, thank you both for helping us think thank out you, of the Stephen. box. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. If you would like additional information about the show, please feel free to send an email to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.